If you fall in love with your older self, you might make a better world that you want your children to age in. I wasn't as experienced yeah. in, in, in community theatre. Yeah. Um, but then having worked with the company, what, what kind of strikes you, uh, and over, definitely over the four years I was there, was that kind of real commitment to ensuring that, and the quality and of kind of community level participation is of the highest standard and the importance in that and the time that's needed to dedicate to that. <laughs> For me, acting is never something I would thought I would do as I got older. And I joined Spare Tire only because I saw a flyer in my doctor's surgery saying that actors, um, people were over 60, were, they were looking for people over 60 to take part in some drama workshops. I never dreamed it would come to this, that I would actually be on stage. So I feel myself to be very privileged. And we're all very supportive of each other, which is nice. Um, and I just feel spoiled, you know, that I'm being indulged in being able to do this now at my age. They could take any subject um, and take it as far as they wanted to, particularly if it was a taboo subject as well. So um, sex, for example. Now, uh, for people with LD and for people of age, um, you would think that, well, of course, they're human beings, so they might well think about sex. That might be something that they think about. That might be something that they experience. But for the rest of society, um, it's not that easy for them to accept that. Mm. Um, and that was just one subject within um, the work that we've done within Spare Tire, where our performers uh, were able to uh, proclaim their voice. And what was great about that was, um, it, it, was, it was teaching the audience as well. It was actually teaching the audience that you do realise that they do think about this <laughs> and they experience this and they're artists so they have a right to articulate that as well. And we was only just talking uh, this morning about how uh, adults with LD uh, are continually and more and more as time progress being treated as children. Yes. Um, and this was, this was a form, this was a physical theatre form that just broke that right through the window. It was just, no, there are adults. You know, I'm directing people who are older than me that have had more experience, that have had different experiences, that have uh, that are human beings and human beings want the same things do you know what I mean or they'll need the same things um, and it's it's really really important to teach society that if you get to a certain age or if you have a certain disability that doesn't change those aspects that doesn't change those aspects of life so you're, you've been a long-standing member of um, Spare Tyres um, companies, uh, performing companies, and usually part of the older people's companies. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, what is a, a very interesting thing about being a member of um, an older age group theatre is that um, we, can, we don't have to be older performers. You can be a child, you can be a sexually active young woman, you can, you can enter any of the areas of your life that you have lived and relive them or 
live out some things that were unlived in yourself. So I feel that um, uh, I feel fortunate to enter something like acting as an older person. The, one of the parts that I really enjoyed was playing Salome. Uh, this is a, um, from a poem by Carol Ann Duffy. To enter the words, to enter the, uh, the feeling of the character behind the poem um, is uh, a very interesting because I would say that although she's a character very, very unlike myself, there are also many emotions that Salome has, which I identify with very, very strongly. It's a, it's a piece about a woman who um, takes men home just purely as sexual objects for herself. She has um, uh, a desire for, to complete her own physical sexuality. But it, there is an underlying uh, dislike of the male, and there is a very uh, bloody reveal um, in the play. But do you think audiences responded to an older performer playing that part? Audiences can be very shocked at an older performer playing a part like that. They don't, I don't think it is expected that an older person is willing to explore, explore uh, a present sexuality, a present passion uh, and intensity and emotion. Mm. I think uh, audiences expect older people to be observers of life and perhaps as wise commentators, but not to actually enter the, the uh, emotion. The, the, as a present experience. You walk in into the Albany and there are all of these um, sort of metal, I'm getting this wrong, pans. but anyway, they pan, pots and pans kind of hanging from the ceilings and there's making these noise and, and there's these smells and it's, you know, I totally love that stuff, like the whole multi-sensory kind of experiential um, nature of it. And then you walk in and you've never seen the Albany looking like this. And then you see people, <laughs> Um, these amazing sort of shadow shapes sort of behind and this incredible gauze that lights up and gorgeous lighting. But I guess for me, creatively um, and politically, in terms of actually, yeah, why shouldn't this sort of money be spent on putting a kick-ass team together where everybody is understanding what it is to have, you know, a production manager, yeah, stage managers, plural, um, you know, a designer, a lighting designer, um, costume, makeup, all of that, like a proper, you know, full team. That felt like a really, and it was something that we'd been working towards. That was like a two year in the making, it was wasn't a, it? It was a year Oh my up. God, that was... Um, Heavy duty. Massive. <laughs> and that was the first time that we brought together... The two ensembles. The two ensembles, which was really exciting and surprising. It's, it's just about, it is about new group dynamics. That's, that's kind of what we're working with. Yeah. That's, that's what it's all about, really. And, um, and everyone's used to work in a very particular way. You should all be, I mean, we work with both groups in a very similar way. Yeah. So it's just getting to know each other, really, about what, what is possible and what isn't possible. Um, and that, that's what we've got to hold on to, really, and, and kind of our strengths in all of this. Feeble so Feeble Minds Mind was um, a show based on Shakespeare's Time and of Athens and actually involved um, both our ensembles, our older people's ensemble and our adults with learning disabilities. So, yeah. you know, it was a more inclusive piece of work. It's the first time you brought them together? Yeah, first okay. time that we brought them together. I spent a year on developing that show. Yeah. Um, and it involved a multi-art form, um, uh, and it kind of was very experiential. So we worked with the senses as well. We worked with new technology as okay. well. So that, that was quite significant. But actually, at the time, I wasn't sure about the show. Okay. I think it was well received because it was such a surprise at that time. You know, we're talking 10 years ago yeah, yeah. to see um, older people and adults with learning disabilities on a stage, yeah. you know, working together. And um, it's, it's hindsight. With hindsight, I kind of go, actually, that was good piece of work yeah 
because then that kind of also then developed into I think what we've come to now with something like the garden a show for people living with dementia yeah um, which is uh, multi-sensory uh, and multi art form okay so it took all the threads from time and did. yeah well actually we've taken all those threads from our work I would say my work with adults with learning disabilities yeah you know how do people um, use different art forms with an, an expression yeah and that's what's really come through in a way and it is a beautiful show because actually it's a non-verbal piece yeah. of theatre mm -hmm. Um, that is extraordinarily inclusive. And what happens at the point where you say, I mm, think we'll do the next one with no words for people to dementia? <laughs> well, the team wasn't happy, actually, when I suggested that. Mm. It was a moment. Yeah. It was a moment. Mm. It was a moment. It was, it was a real moment. Um, and actually, I think it did take some convincing. But actually, once they did it, yeah. they suddenly realised how brilliant it was because yeah. actually we removed a barrier. We'd moved the verbal barrier. People weren't having to think about words. What's the word they need? What's, yeah. yeah, they weren't having to kind of um, remember what their meaning was, and they were just responding to uh, emotion yeah. and body language. Yeah, and the moment that they're in. Yeah, and the moment that they're in. So one of the things that's happening with older people's work mirrors what happened with the growth of youth arts in about 1986 or seven. So I used to remember going to meetings in Brixton with people like Owen Kelly who'd stand up and talk in paragraphs and be incredibly eloquent and understand about the first three words and uh, and partly what he was arguing for was about the delivery of uh, the delivery of work people would go out in a kind of colonial way and work with them young people then and instead of working with young people and calling out whatever wanted to be made and something similar is hap happens with older people's work. So the more that it becomes, professionalised isn't the right word, the more it becomes sort of standardised, the more it becomes everywhere. What tends to happen is people see the brand and not the, the content. And so they do work which they think is the work that. Um, and and you, there's some really simple sort of ways of spotting this. If you ever see a, a video of some piece of work and it's got a solo piano, just bin that work, forget it. Because it's got that low key, la 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 la, miserable thing going on. If it's only got people's hands in it, then it hasn't really got people in it. It's not really people making it. So you see these little tropes and memes, um, and, and you see them in the videos that advertise the work or promote the work, but you also see it in the work itself. And we, we're trying to make work, or some of us are trying to make work, which is about the process of the global planet aging or people living longer, which they've never done before, which is a miracle. It's incredible that we can live to 90 or to 80 something on a regular basis. So that's territory we've never been in. And so it's a story we've never told. So, so we need to tell that story differently. We need different tools. It might look different. It might be told by different people. It might take place in different platforms or different venues. And if it looks like the stuff that came before, then actually it's not doing the work that it needs to do. And the artists are not doing the work that they really should be doing. They need to step up. So I'm part of a, a network at the moment called uh, Dementia Arts and Wellbeing Network, which was set up by Nottingham University. Yeah. And there, we're experiencing each other's practice. Yeah. And we're debating and discussing, you know. And is it a kind of equal exchange of practices? It is very equal. Yeah. It is very equal. And, and I think um, what's been interesting is that, so, well, actually, maybe maybe it wasn't, perhaps. I, I have to say, when we first started, I felt it was very academic. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, I think the art has now come through. And also what's had to shift and change is because we also have people living with dementia coming into the conversation and experiencing, yeah. you know, those academic discussions or those creative discussions. It's shifted. And... and so when you talk about the work that Spare Tire make, or you make with Spare Tire, you make together with Spare Tire, mm -hmm. do you think of it as being f through separate brackets with people with learning difficulties, with gender, uh, around uh, feminist issues, or do you think of it as, as differently connected? I think they, they appear to be in silos. Mm -hmm. And partly they have to be in silos because that's how the funding sure. streams happen. Yeah. But the practice actually is very similar. Yeah. 
Um, so the practice is that we are walking into a new community, you learn the language of that community, you discover how they want to express themselves, you provide that framework, you provide those skills, and then you just go, do what you want. We will support you in the risk that you want to take. Yeah. Um, we will tell you and talk to you about perhaps what might work and what may not work, but at the end of the day, you will have agency to decide how you want to do that.